Good evening. I'm just lowering the, the microphone slightly. I'm also standing up, which, um, which marginally increases my height. <laughs> Welcome to this wonderful uh, celebratory closing event for Refugee Tales. And please will all the walkers in the room give themselves and each other a massive round of applause. My name is um, Shami Chakrabarti, and I, I used to be called the most dangerous woman in Britain by the Sun newspaper. Actually, you can tell, you can tell a lot about an audience by how they respond to a statement like that. I've had the great pleasure of, uh, of using that as, a, as an icebreaker and, and dining out on that um, for some years, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, you go to some places and you get slightly frosty reception. You go to, um, you go to other places. I, w I once went to Derry, London Derry. That's how one should describe it, always. Remember that, Derry, London Derry. And uh, it was a bizarre event. I was, uh, I was invited as a guest of the British Council. Interesting, Union Jacks everywhere, me, Derry, London, Derry. I said, be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> the Sun newspaper wants to describe me as the most dangerous woman in Britain. Mmm. <laughs> there were some heads, no, 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 no. And actually after the, and I, and I went and did my grim and worthy speech about all sorts of terrible things that were happening in the world. And uh, afterwards, uh, uh, an immaculately dressed woman of a certain age, suited and booted and made up came up to me and forgive my I'm not going to do the accent but she came up and said they only said you were the most dangerous woman in Britain I really was <laughs> I thought shit I was transported back to school I was that swatty Asian girl behind the you know um, that was pretty scary and she then revealed to me that she had been convicted for many years for um, conspiracy to cause explosions on the mainland. Yeah, that was pretty scary. But she was now an elected politician in the, in the Stormont Parliament working for peace and justice in Northern Ireland. And I don't tell you that just to be funny, though it's always nice to be a little bit funny um, in these less than funny times. I tell you that because there is hope. Because when I was a girl, I thought I would never live to see the fall of the Berlin Wall. I thought I would never live to see liberation in what was then apartheid South Africa. I thought I would never live to see relative peace in Northern Ireland. And I never thought I would see a Conservative Prime Minister promoting same-sex marriage. <laughs> right? So I know that it hasn't, there hasn't been much good news lately. Um, and the arc of history doesn't go in a completely straight line. It's a, it's a bit of a, a at the moment. It's you, you, well, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. But but you people in this room this evening, you are the hope. You are the solution in these dark times. Please, whatever you do this evening, please remember that. Final dangerous woman story, or perhaps penultimate dangerous woman story. I. Different reactions around this great and sometimes divided country. But when you go to the great city of Liverpool with an opener like that, you get a standing <laughs> ovation before you've even <laughs> begun. But of course, last year in the run-up to, um, to the general elections, and that seemed like a decade ago now, doesn't it? In the run-up to the 2015 general election, that other great... Uh, newspaper institution of this of this country, the Daily Mail newspaper. Dis uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> that's the one. Our great friends at the Daily Mail decided, um, to my horror, that I was no longer worthy of the title. I was no yeah, no longer the most dangerous woman in Britain, and instead that title apparently now belongs to a certain charismatic politician north of the border. <laughs> Yeah, you're all, you're all applying for your Scottish passports now, aren't you? Um, and to add insult to, to injury, the First Minister of Scotland is actually a little bit younger than me as well. 
this happens. This happens. And so, as you know, I've hung up my um, my um, megaphone. That's why I've only got this little microphone this evening. And um, and uh, yeah, so I'm just the second most, third most, fifteenth most used to be most dangerous woman in Britain. But but I am, like all of you, an activist and an optimist. And we all work together for positive change, even in these difficult dark times we will we will make opportunity out of these challenges yeah. Yeah. Now you don't need me to tell you too much about this wonderful project fast becoming a movement that is refugee tales because you because you built it you are that movement but you do know and you will forgive me reminding you that the the objective at the moment, the single demand, it's very important to focus, is an end to indefinite detention of, of refugees and asylum seekers in this country. It is an inescapable moral truth. This detention cannot be justified. If it cannot be justified for people accused of very serious criminal offences, how can it be justified for people who have done nothing wrong? Right? Um, the, um, the leader of the opposition was not so long ago, well I say not so long ago, everything feels like 20 years ago. A couple of months ago, the leader of the opposition went to Calais and on his return to that great uh, institution of, that is the Palace of Westminster, he was castigated by the by the the outgoing the soon outgoing Prime Minister. He was castigated for going to Calais to talk to a bunch of migrants. Um, I took some umbrage of that because you see I I'm descended from migrants. Not a bunch, you understand. Two is all it takes. <laughs> Um, but I took, yeah, I, and you know, my, my parents were, were what you might call economic migrants to the, you might, economic migrants to this country. They were invited <coughs> by a previous Conservative Prime Minister, Mr. Macmillan. You're, you're all too young and fresh faced to even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Look at you, babes, babes, children. <laughs> Especially you, sir. <laughs> but, um, but the idea, the idea that desperate people, who might put their children in trucks and in boats and not know if they'd ever see them again, where they would live. The idea that they should be demonised as a bunch of migrants is something that I think is, um, is one of the most shameful things about modern Britain. There are a few other things, but that's pretty much the, the pits as far as I'm concerned. And um, one of the wonderful things about refugee tales and this project of telling stories is that it gives a voice to the voiceless and it is capable of rehumanizing people who have been turned into yes the most vulnerable but perhaps also the most demonized wretched people on the planet and that is what you do in this wonderful project that's what the writers and the activists and the marchers and everybody everybody here tonight that, that that's what you're engaged in and, and that in, in my belief is the is the solution and the immediate demand an end to indefinite detention which is so cruel is so wrong it's illegal it's immoral it's counterproductive and it must stop and uh, yes enough from me because you've got um, some wonderful people to to hear now you, um, people who are still dangerous <laughs> and, 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 and they're going to be very dangerous particularly the particularly mr. Bragg he's, he's very dangerous with he does things with a guitar that other people can't do with anyway with a Kalashnikov right um, but, but 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 first of all I want you to give a absolutely rapturous round of applause to someone who is a poet but also a co-organiser of this wonderful, wonderful project. Please welcome, reading the prologue to the tales, David Hurd. Thank you, Shami. Thank you for being so clear and fierce. It's very important. 
Um, the Refugee Tales is a walk in solidarity with refugees, asylum seekers and detainees. And as we walk, we tell the tale of people who have been detained and people who have worked with people who have been detained. Uh, it's modelled, as you'll have gathered, uh, on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and therefore uh, the poem, the book, needed a prologue. So here's the prologue. This prologue is not a poem. It is an act of welcome. It announces that people present reject the terms of a debate that criminalises human movement. It is a declaration this night in Westminster of solidarity. It says that we have started, that we are starting out, that by the oldest action, which is listening to tales that other people tell, of others told by others, we set out to make a language that opens politics, establishes belonging, where a person dwells. Where they are now, which is to say where we are now, walking in solidarity along an ancient track, that we come back to the geography of it, north of Dover, that where the language starts, now long and folk to go and on this pilgrimage. In July, not April, and with the sweet showers far behind us, though with the birds singing and people sleeping with open eye, and what we long for is to hear each other's tales and to tell them again as told by some hath holpen walking so pricketh him nature not believing the stories our officials tell because we know too much about what goes unsaid and what we choose to walk for is the possibility of trust in language to hear the unsaid spoken and then repeated made unambiguous and loud set out over a landscape gathered step by step as by virtue of walking which we call our commons, every sap vessel bathed in moisture, and what that commons calls for is what these stories sound. Of crossing, for to seek and strand strands, in moments of emergency, one that they were seek. Of tribunals, where the unsaid goes unspoken, lines of questioning no official has written down. People present by video, answers mistranslated, as outside by the station, at the dead of morning, as the young sun rises, woken in their homes, people are picked up and detained. Routinely and arbitrarily, in every halt and heath, under the sun, while small fowls make an melody. And why we walk is to make a spectacle of welcome. This political carnival across the weald of Kent, people circulating, making music, listening to stories, people urgently need said. And said, and said again, stories of the new geography, stories of arrival, of unaccompanied minors, of people picked up and detained, of process and mistranslation, networks of visitors and friends, this new language we ask for, forming, strung out along the North Downs way, which makes it a question of scale. Consider just the scale of the undertaking. Chaucer's pilgrims crossing Palatai and Turkey and Rus, across the Great Sea, which is the Mediterranean, dark these days, not like wine, crossing through Flounders, crossing through Artois, crossing the water at Picardy, and all the while finding stories, and then all of them gathering one night in London. And so the host says, since we're walking, why don't we tell each other tales? And so they do, out of Southwark. And what comes out of Southwark is a whole new language of travel and assembly and curiosity and welcome. To make his English sweet, that's why Chaucer told his tales. How badly we need English to be made sweet again, rendered hostile by act of law, so that even friendship is barely possible. There, as this lord was keeper of the cell, so we might actually talk, and in talking, come to understand the journey. Tender, says the poet, to Canterbury they wend. Tender, to hold, from the French, tendre, from the English, for listening to a story as it is said, to attend, tendre, and then writing it down because it isn't written, because the hearings in the British immigration system are not courts of record. So there are no stories, and people leave as if there never had been stories, and so nobody who reaches a verdict has a real story with which to contend. So now we are telling them en masse, and people will listen, in Sondry Lons, and especially from every shire's end. But this prologue is not a poem. It is an act of introduction. 
bathed every vein in sitch liqueur, and all the introduction can do is set the tone, albeit the tone is everything. And the tone is welcoming, and the tone is celebratory, and the tone is courteous, and the tone is real. And every step sets out a demand, and every demand is urgent. And what we call for is an end to this inhuman discourse. And so we stop this night, and the host steps up, and he says, listen to this story. One that April with his shura's suit. And the room goes quiet, and a voice starts up. And then the language alters, sweet, tender, pear said to the root. Thank you. And that, of course, was David Hurd, who, with Anna Pincus um, and so many others, makes this, um, this wonderful project possible, growing year on year now, I see. And I'm sure that. Uh, I'm sure the ICA won't be big enough this time, <laughs> this time next year. Now, for a tale. And we're going to hear um, the refugees tale from a wonderful poet, Patience Agbabe, who in 2014 published her own version of the Canterbury Tales called Telling Tales, but set, set in modern times for this this internationalist multicultural world that some people reject but we love and embrace. So please, another wonderful welcome for Patience Agbabi reading The Refugee's Tale. Hello, good evening everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces out there. Um, I'm, I'm really, really honoured to be here, and I was especially honoured to be asked to be part of this project, being a massive chaucer head and already being obsessed with that London Canterbury route. And um, when I wrote my poem last year, well, just before I actually stood up on stage for the gig, I, I arrived at the, at the venue at Oxted in Surrey and to be greeted by the walkers who were sort of very tired and very sweaty, but the, but the love that I, that I was experiencing from them, the, the fellowship, which is, some, which is a word Chaucer uses, and I know David mentions in the introduction to the book, was so profound. And I felt really deprived that I hadn't actually been on the walk, you know, that I just sort of turned up to do the, to do the poet thing. Um, so I pledged that if this unfortunate um, it, stuff was still happening, I would, I would end up going on the walk again. And of course, it did happen again. And um, even last year, I said, this feels like a movement. And then this year, to be walking with you for two days from Rochester to Gravesend, Gravesend to Dartford. And it's my home territory as well, I have to say. And um, it was especially moving to, to walk through with, with you all. And the actual physical movement of all of us moved me. You know, that word movement, it's kind of, we're part of a movement, we're physically moving. There's something profound about moving through the countryside with you. So I just wanted to, to share that and say thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on to my tale, which is set in Sudan. There's two things I'll say. For reader is not her real name. And she didn't work in a bank, but the rest is true. And this I would call a collaboration between the two of us. The Refugee's Tale. Maybe the real story begins here, in this office, before you press record, and we look in the mirror of each other's eyes. We're first time meeting. Maybe you say the word refugee in your head when you call me for reader. Refugee, what is that burn mark on your hand? You already have a story of the torture I suffered in my war-torn homeland. But these marks are from cooking bread for my family. This is the first time I'm cooking in my life. I never even made a cup of tea back home. I make a very good falafel. You must try. Are you recording? Food of the homestead. Christians, Muslims, we bake the same flatbread. Christians and Muslims break the same bread before the change. Though my parents are Egyptian, I am born in Sudan. Sudan is in my blood. 
Though I am always a Christian, even for ten years I loved Muslims more than Christians. My Muslim neighbours care for my parents when we jet set to Paris and Rome. I love Muslims as I love the Nuba, love my country. We cops, always first class. We had good English, all of us working in the banks. Cleaner to driver, everyone is close to Farida. No door that is not wide open, thanks to God. Since I leave university mid-year, and that day I start my career. The day I started my banking career, my parents complained, but they couldn't control me. Back then was good atmosphere. I am making good money. My husband is running his business in patents. We build a large family house. We have six children and some flats in Egypt for the pensions of our parents. Always we are donating to the poor of the brethren. Then government changes. Doors begin to close. At work, what took two hours now takes two weeks. And Christians are flocking overnight to the US. Then the rumour of a banking leak. Watching the planes flying over my head, I refuse to leave my country, my homestead. I refused. I love my country, my homestead, my mother, my father, my husband's father and mother, the motherland. I would rather be buried dead than leave. I was the last one to leave. My brother-in-law, he's unwell. He needed support to heal his divided mind. We nurture him like a plant and polish each leaf, each flower to help seal him together like the two faiths that can't be divided by politicians completely corrupted, splitting the country like an open wound. They insert a lie and this Christian's abducted. I refused to cover my head, but my heart was divided by language, river, boundary, country. The day I retreated my status to refugee. Why should I be treated as stranger? as refugee in the country I was born, barricaded in my bank, while demonstrators outside shout blasphemy. Hundreds, thousands fed with propaganda poison. We're told, remain calm, stay here, you have food. But my phone buzzed like a dying insect. My husband, my children, my parents pleading with God. I remembered the side door the back exit where the generator hummed in the dark and I find myself descending the iron stairs, the noise of the crowd out front like a bull shark and somehow my legs find the car, my hands on the gears and my friend is closing the door, imagining the crowbar fist of the crowd pounding on my car. The fist headed crowd are pounding on my car. My car is not moving. Each fist has a face that looks like my own. How can we be at war when the Nile flows through our twin faiths? If my car is my coffin, their fists are the clods of earth, the rich yellow soil of my country. I start the engine, praying, dear God, let it, let it not fail. But my car is the black and the steel of a bulletproof jacket. Today, it will save my life. With my hands on the steering wheel and my life in the hand of God, it begins to move and the waving fists part like the Red Sea. I still think it's miracle I find myself free. It's miracle I'm still having job but my mind is not free. Each day government is ringing for bank information that I am not having. They don't believe me. More doors are closed in my face with no explanation. Maybe somewhere there's a typed memo. On a blank piece of paper, someone has printed my name. Someone is watching my house. How? I don't know. Anger is a gloved hand and a flickering flame. That night, the family is sleeping on the second floor, except my oldest son and daughter coming back from Coptic Club. They open the side door and all they are smelling is smoke. Someone broke into our life, their hand through our window bars that night, 
to smother the moon and stars. The night smoke choked the moon and the stars. I tried to call the fire. I tried to call them hundreds of times. If it wasn't for our neighbours hearing us shouting, my neighbours came and there was water. I shouted like crazy, please, please help us at this address. And nobody came. Like they arranged it, maybe. The fire brigade not to come and we all perish. My husband insisted to break the room and go inside and the flames, I was so worried about him. But my neighbours, all my family survived. We prayed there together, Christian and Muslim. In the heat of the fire, we knelt on the earth and wept. I thought I'd forget, but their love I'll never forget. I thought I'd forget in this life, but I never forget the three hours it took for the fire engine to arrive felt like three years. There is no regret. We were lucky to be alive. But how can you sleep then? knowing the country you love wants you to die. How can you close your eyes shut when they've been pitted like an olive? I'm praying to God every night, but then after that, they started with my husband. He was away with his business abroad. They arrested him at customs, coming back to our country, his papers ignored. He sent something bad, would, had a premonition the day they imprisoned my husband, he had not eaten. They put my husband in prison. He is not eating the right foods. They knew he was diabetic, but they're starving him of insulin. Wouldn't let me give him his medicine. I was frantic. I didn't know where he was based. Didn't know what they can do to him to get me. And finally I decided there was no way. I could not resist. That's when I decided to leave my beloved country. They said, you should be grateful we left you in peace. This is a Muslim country, but we let you pray in your churches. Cooperate for your husband's release. I know nothing of the bank information to this day. Always I am wearing my cross and refuse to sweat in the heavy black and steel of my bulletproof jacket. The heavy blackened steel of a bulletproof jacket is the depression I wear on the worst days when freedom here weighs heavier than the death threat back home and my family fall on their knees. But back home I refused. Why should Farida wear widow's black when there is still hope for my husband to bend the bars on his prison windows? Always there's light on the horizon. I knew a Muslim high official a friend of my husband's, for reader, trust me, I have a plan. So I'm buying us tickets to London, even then thinking we can come back when things cool down. The day of his release, I'm barely breathing. Meeting him at the airport, the sky is bleeding. When I met him at the airport, he was bleeding. His chest was full of blood, and he had ulcerative colitis. He is needing urgent medical, very sick. He bled onto the flight, and is sleeping very peaceful, and the whole of my family is here and safe. As soon as we land, we take him to hospital, and they save his life. An international visa is an open door, but the next day we go to Croydon to claim asylum. And though the lady is very kind, it pains me more than everything to cut myself from my home, my country, with each section of my claim, my story, depressed photo in a frame. The story depends where you put the frame. With my oldest son, my oldest daughter, each in a separate room, but exactly the same questions each the author of a story they will match to see if the grief fits together the jigsaw of what it is to love your country and be forced to leave your whole life behind in broken images 
For me it was lucky. Maybe God knows how much I suffered. Maybe it was easy to check my job, my contacts. Maybe the fictions in the newspapers were detained by the facts. But now I'm underclass, my head covered with shame. How am I begging when I can't remember my name? How can I begin to remember my name when I can't leave the house? When the ache of leaving my mother, she died. The blame is too much. My whole body drowned with grieving in this room with the ribbed roof where I sit with my sins heavy as Jonah. This silent attic where memories play back like the cries of muezzins mixed with the cries from the priests when she first fell sick. But good people come who open me to feel again for others and as I translate the words of a refugee life to a form I begin to heal. Their voice is my own voice striking a chord. May our truth conquer fear. Maybe the real story begins here. Maybe the real story begins here. When Christians and Muslims broke the same flatbread. The day I started my banking career and refused to leave my country, my homestead. Maybe the day I retreated my status to refugee. Or the fist-headed crowd pounding on my car and the miracle when I found myself free. The night the smoke choked the moon and stars. I thought I forget, but some things you never forget. The day they imprisoned my husband, he is not eating. The heavy blackened steel of my bulletproof jacket when I met him at the airport broken, bleeding. The story ends where you put the frame, but however it begins, remember my name. That was Patience Sekbabi. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, um, my, the title of my poem is Life. Love and loathing. He was born in a society that children without parents had no rights. That children without parents had to sleep by the street lights. Instead of milk bottle, he had a plastic bag with dendrites. Only six years old, wanting to, wanting to refuse but nowhere to go and no one to hold. In his mind, this wasn't the life he, des he destined to be. He just wanted love and to be cared like other children. He used to wonder what it's like to have a family. Is it like to have support, care, joy, sorrows, sharing with each other? Or is it like when you are dressed up to school by your mother? Or fighting for video games with your brother? Or is it when your dad supports you against other? Or none of this? And just to have some friends in gutter? Fighting to survive but protective for each other. Instead of love and care, unclarity, confusion, hatred surrounded him. People quick to blame religions, he had no choice to then to agree. Our selfish ways has taken us to the grave. But if you make it to the heaven before me, please tell my friends that I'm fine now and out from the streets. And ultimately, drug was in the trade, but shit, that killed you. I am fortunate, otherwise I could have been drug addict, overdosed and dead. Instead, I'm still alive. See, taking drugs was a huge mistake. 
not into religion, but I believe God is one, God is great. I'm blessed to testify because I know how hatred looks like. It looks like getting ignored by everyone, no identity, left on the streets to die. And I know how, I know how hatred looks like. Victim of exploitations and tortured, even in a bright daylight. And I know how hatred looks like. Sleeping in the streets, empty stomach on cold freezing nights. And I know what hatred looks like. But today, that defeats the premise. Looking at all of you, I know what love looks like. It looks like a full moon night giving a bright moonlight. And I know what love looks like. Our extensive handshakes that hold us together tight. I know what love looks like. You, I, us, Together as a family, we, our love looks like. Thank you. So that was AJ and, of course, the wonderful Ali Smith. Wasn't that an espresso for your soul? <laughs> Wasn't it? Now, would you like to make that, that a double espresso, perhaps? <laughs> and you also heard from David Hurd. You heard from Patient Zubabi. You heard from Ali Smith. You heard. Oh, you all got to come up and get flowers, apparently. Not just recognition, but flowers, please. Come on stage. Come on stage, please. Patience. David, come and get your flowers and your recognition. Ali. You also heard from AJ. Is AJ coming? Come on, AJ. Up you go. Up you go. Come on, AJ. Come on, AJ. No, 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 get into AJ. AJ? Get into AJ. Thanks to everyone who performed this evening. But special thanks to all of you for giving voice to refugee tales. <laughs>